Hi, my name is Julia Feldman, and I'm a researcher on material design. Thanks for joining our talk on how to design with beauty and accessibility in mind. Designing products that can be used by everyone requires creativity and thoughtfulness. Any product that hopes to reach millions or even billions of people will need to work for people who are blind or have low vision. It will need to work for people who have motor disabilities. It will need to work for people who have cognitive disabilities, difficulty with numbers, or difficulty with languages, people who are deaf or hard of hearing, and people with speech impediments. There are also moment-to-moment -moment instances that your product needs to support. It should also work for people who are riding a bus or carrying groceries and may only have one hand free to use their device. It should work for people who are using their device outside in the bright sunlight where the colors and contrast on the screen may be washed out, making it more difficult to see. This is what it means to design for everyone. To design in a way where everyone, regardless of their abilities or environment, can access your product. Accessible design ensures people with disabilities can perceive, understand, and interact with product services and tools, and that all users can participate equally and without barriers. In this talk, we'll introduce not only how we design accessible products, but how we embrace accessible design as a way to create even more beautiful and expressive experiences. First, Dahlia, a program manager on our central accessibility team, will give a brief overview of accessibility and how accessibility standards can enable creativity in the design development process. Next, Julian, a UX designer on material design, will share how he works to make things accessible and expressive. Finally, I'll introduce an example of how and why we test our designs for accessibility, like in the new focus state design through research. Thanks, Julia. Hi, my name is Dahlia Shukri, and I'm a program manager on Google's product inclusion, equity, and accessibility team. I'm going to share more details about how standards enable creativity in the product development process. I'll be discussing how to embrace accessibility standards to create more inclusive experiences for everyone. As of March 2023, the World Health Organization has estimated that 1.3 billion people, 16% of the world's population, or one in every six of us across the world, experience significant disability. Given the broad range of disability experiences, we must diligently consider all users, abilities, and situations. This practice, called universal design, enables us to build inclusive and transformative products and experiences. Consider some digital and physical products that many of us use multiple times daily, such as closed captions, phones, email, autocomplete, electric toothbrushes, and curb cuts and sidewalks. These are just a few examples of things that were originally created to work well for people with disabilities, but ultimately work better for everyone and were then adopted beyond their initial intended audiences due to their broad benefits. This is sometimes called the curb cut effect. Accessibility improves and connects our global society. You and your team could be on the brink of developing that next big thing. So, how does one develop that next big thing and make accessibility more prevalent in their organization's processes? We recognize there can be various organizational challenges to address. A robust set of accessibility standards, guidelines, processes, design systems, and tools are critical to achieve organizational success. Your organization's accessibility standards can be integrated in all aspects of the product development lifecycle your vision, strategy, and research, design systems, product design and development, testing, rollout, customer support, and maintenance and iteration. Implement the adage of nothing about us without us. Start by talking with users with disabilities so that you can appropriately determine accessibility needs in your product and standards. Then, define accessibility standards that outline expected user experiences for a product. These standards should also specify the responsibilities each job function contributes to achieve this collective team goal. Everyone can and should influence accessibility, specifically your product manager working on strategy and market opportunities, your UX team members working on research, design systems, interaction patterns, or visual designs, your engineers working on development, your testers leveraging manual or automated testing tools, and your program managers working on release, rollout, and product support. 
You can also audit each of these job functions processes to identify additional opportunities to incorporate accessibility earlier on. During the process workflow audit, identify major phases, especially kickoff points, midpoint check-ins, final sign-offs, and any approval requirements. Confirm if your organization's accessibility standards are adopted in each of these phases and whether your standards need to be updated to provide more role-specific information. Which high-impact opportunities can you start with? For example, a high-impact effort for us is our collaboration to make and maintain the material design system to be more accessible. The material design system is a centralized suite of designs, engineered components, and standards that can be combined to design cohesive products. At Google, the material design system impacts products across the company, making them a leading source of accessibility solutions. By co-developing and applying accessibility standards to material strategy, research, design, implementation, and testing, we address accessibility early on and also free up time for product teams to focus on their final implementations and accessibility innovations. Later, Julia will be deep diving our upcoming focus state designs and the associated research. That collaboration started when our teams co-developed accessibility standards. We then applied those standards to materials research methodology and proposed components and designs. We also evaluated the use cases of the components and how users would achieve their navigation goals. Measurement of use cases and critical user journeys should be done before design or the product launch and again afterwards as a benchmark. There are multiple methods for measuring use case effectiveness. Depending on how far into the development process your team is, these methods could range from leveraging automated tooling like Google's Accessibility Scanner, to lightweight internal evaluations, to more robust studies with users with various abilities. After launch, the team might complete regression testing of their product's top five to 10 use cases at once, or tackle one to two use cases at a time to cover the entire product. Leveraging accessibility standards throughout the development process sets a minimum baseline for teams. They can then apply their creativity to come up with robust, beautiful, and innovative solutions, and the rising tide lifts all boats. Thank you, Dalia, and thank you for joining us. Hi, I'm Julian Gonzalez. I'm a designer on the material design team, and today I'm excited to share a design example of how accessible designs afford us the opportunity to design more expressively. Let's picture the scene. Imagine it's a hot New York summer day, you get home sweating and dash over to your thermostat to turn up the air. You think to yourself, did it work? Did I set the correct setting? The first material design principle is to learn before and not after. When building products, let's consider not just what a product looks like, but also who will use it. And let's also consider that accessibility should be embraced in the initial phases of design, not an afterthought. A thermostat may be something that's designed starting with a clean white piece of paper, but how it's used is never that simple. Where it's used will be any number of rooms, messy or clean, hot or cold, by any number of people with all different kinds of abilities, or heights, or age, interests, or distractions. Whether the individual has a visual impairment, motor impairment, is turning it on at night in a dark room while half asleep, or is an older individual. They need to be able to react to their environment and adjust the temperature. So to properly design with this sort of flexibility, we really consider these use cases before we start designing. The second material design accessibility principle is to honor the user. Importantly, we want to address our users' wants, needs, and abilities so that we can create truly inclusive user experiences. How can we create a thermostat that feels flexible and made just for our users when we have so many users with different wants, needs, and abilities? A little about the thermostat. The thermostat is designed in a singular, ring-like shape that it's intended to display the current temperature at the center of the display at all times. The dial track is meant to guide the user towards selecting a desired state, in our case, the desired temperature. 
while the dials track highlights the distance to the current set point. Adding multiple entry points to changing the temperature can increase accessibility and can be the piece of flexibility our users need. Maybe it just means that in addition to a slider, including a button press can be an easier movement for some. What else can we do? Maybe add a connection to the user's phone so they can change the temperature from anywhere. Or maybe add a voice-activated feature as another interaction method for people with mobility impairments, or for someone with their hands full because they are feeding a baby. And the third material design accessibility principle is to embrace standards as creative opportunities. What else can we do to make this more accessible and more visually appealing? This now has become an opportunity to challenge our assumptions, to come up with solutions that are innovative and can serve many. Well, one thing we may notice is that the part of the track that is selected to change the temperature appears similar in design to the rest of the track, which can make it confusing to know how to set the temperature. And there are many ways to fix this. We might change the color or contrast of the selected portion to be more distinct. Or maybe we could use shape changes. In the version sketch, the selected portion is thicker than the unselected portion. So this thermostat is gaining an expressive look as we consider different characteristics that might increase its accessibility. So let's keep going. Let's consider adding visible text to clarify the room this thermostat setting is for. And let's think. Your hand may cover the number in the center as you're making a selection. Let's maybe introduce an additional cue to the affordance. What if it pops as you drag the handle to make your selection? Or how about emphasizing that the handle changes shape while it's pressed? There are multiple creative and exciting design considerations we could implement to embrace accessibility standards. We can keep iterating until we get the right balance of beauty and accessibility. Maybe make it brighter as users turn it, or produce sound feedback so users feel confident the request was successful. What's most important is that as you keep iterating, you end up with something that is accessible and also uniquely your product. This was just a quick design brainstorm, but hopefully it is now evident how making a product accessible actually creates a unique journey and a visual appearance which creates a personalized experience for every user. Expression in design is not an odds with accessibility. This is only one example of how something can be easier to use for everyone, yet visually distinctive. I'll turn it over to Julia to give a real life case study of how we use research to help create expressive and accessible experiences. Thanks, Julian. I'd love to give you an example of a real life component challenge that we had here at Google. I'll discuss some of the research that went into designing the new focus state. So what is a focus state? Well, have you ever used the tab button on your keyboard to move on a screen or contract, and when you land on a text field, there's a visual indicator? Maybe it's a blue box or a colored outline to clarify where you are. Or think of when you might be using a streaming service and you're using your remote control to select the video that you want to watch. How do you know which video you're currently on and ready to interact with? So a focus indicator helps a user track where they are. This is particularly important for users who use keyboard navigation but we all really rely on focus indicators all the time. Like Julian said, we want to learn before and not after we design. So we put different types of focus states in front of all sorts of people so we could identify what types of focus states work best for everyone. To do so, we created 2,000 variations of focus states for buttons, switches, and chips, and built a bit of a game similar to whack-a-mole. In this study, a trial started by clicking a circle at the center of the screen, so all participants started the trial in the same spot. Then participants clicked the highlighted element on the screen as fast as they could. The elements were placed in a circle, so the participant's cursor, which started in the middle of the screen, was not closer to any element on the screen. How the element was highlighted on the screen varied on each trial. For all the trials, we collected response time and accuracy data so we could identify which focus states perform best. With that, we tested indicator ring designs that varied in padding or spacing, 
color, degrees of thickness, and appeared either on the si inside or outside of the element. We also varied shape, which meant the outline molded to the element or was rectangular. We tested it in both light and dark themes. We had over a thousand participants in the study, and those participants had a range of ages and abilities indicated by their assistive technology use, so things like screen magnification and color inversion. So let's talk about what we found. Some of the worst options included a version with a thickness of one dip for the inside and outside outlines with no padding. These led to the longest response times and lowest accuracy rates in participants finding the highlighted element. Ultimately, we do not recommend this approach. Let's discuss an example of a design that performed very well. Here we have a focus ring with a padding of four dip with a thickness of two dip for the inner outline and a thickness of four dip for the outer outline. Whether the ring molded to the element or was rectangular did not impact findability. We worked with the design team to go through all possible design characteristics. Designs that took statistically significantly longer to find were removed from the options. That left us with a set of options to evaluate how each design may still incur some extra time, even if not statistically different. For example, consider a focus ring that's too dip thick. With the research we conducted, we can tell you that if you decrease that thickness of the ring by one dip, it will take about 71 milliseconds longer for people to find. What this means is that we created a precise toolkit that we can work directly with design to effectively use. Together with design, we were able to use this research to identify a path forward to making a focus state that's both accessible and expressive. Now, when you use material design components, you'll know how it was designed and researched with both accessibility and beauty in mind. Hopefully you learned a little bit about why there's so much value in making products accessible. By making your product more accessible, you make it more unique. You can make it more expressive and you make your product more relevant to the people who actually use it. I hope you picked up some tools to test your own designs and teach your teams about building accessible products. Thanks for joining this session.